Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to go. We are live on uh, broadcast right now. So based on that and based on the fact that we have quorum, I'm going to call the meeting to order at uh, 1.04 p.m. It looks like from here. And the meeting itself is the council meeting for the Township of Muskoka Lakes, April the 10th, 2024. As I said earlier, we do have quorum. In fact, we have all members present or by Zoom, save and except for Councillor Alan Edwards, who has sent his regrets. Um, I also want to confirm that we have the CAO, the clerk, and other members of our senior management team present here in the room or online um, to assist us as necessary through the course of the meeting. And I would also like to acknowledge that we are on lands traditionally occupied by Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples have cared for this territory for the benefit of future generations, and their stewardship throughout the ages is recognized. As I mentioned earlier, today's meeting is being live streamed and it's being recorded on the Township of Muskoka Lakes website and YouTube channel. By participating uh, in this open public meeting today, you are consenting to your image, your voice and your comments being recorded and posted online. We um, solicited uh, feedback on the agenda through the standard route, which is our uh, email address, tmlpublickcomment at muskokalakes.ca, but uh, we received none, is that correct? Okay, we do have a supplementary agenda. We'll talk to that in a second. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, actually wanna talk about it right now. I will also acknowledge that we do have a supplementary agenda uh, and pursuant to section 7.2.1, of Council Procedural Bylaw 2023-089, a supplementary agenda was issued to add the following matters, and there are three. Uh, first, under item 6B, public comments, maximum of five minutes. We have added Brian Hansen regarding 11.A.1, uh, ZBA-57-22, Averbuck, part of lot 27, concession five, parts two, Five, six, eight, and 12, plan 35R-23401, Watt, roll number 2-9-087. Uh, next item added uh, via supplementary agenda is uh, 7.A.5 under the consent agenda. Uh, April the 4, 2024, special council minutes have been added. And the last item added by supplementary agenda is item 13.D, Council in closed session. Council in closed session will be held in the absence of the public pursuant to section 239 sub 2 of the municipal, excuse me, municipal act 2001. And that's um, at the end of the public and uh, the open part of the meeting. So we are uh, in business and ready to roll. Um, before we get to item number one, or whatever it is, item, before we get to the delegate, uh, invited presentations, I'm just going to take two minutes to acknowledge that we are at the beginning of the last council meeting for our Director of Public Works, Ken Becking. Um, I wanted to recognize it now because I had a feeling that he might slip out later on uh, to avoid this, but <laughs> he is uh, here with us uh, and uh, he is retiring. Uh, and how many days again? An hours and minutes? So 12 days. Um, Ken has been with us for about five years, roughly, has served in an extraordinary capacity. Um, he has served not just the constituents of the township of Muskoka Lakes exceedingly well, he served all of us on council. He's been a great, a great source of intelli intelligence and support and passion. Um, I will tell you that the first time I met Ken was over at the, I believe it was the Bala Sportsplex. And I was shoveling a sandbag 
full of sand. And Ken stood there and looked at me for two minutes and said, has anybody ever showed you which end of the shovel should go into the sand? <laughs> uh, I like that about them. Yeah. So uh, I'd like a lot of you, when you first meet Ken, you think he's all bluster and, and crustiness. And of course, once you get to know him, he is all bluster and crustiness. <laughs> so, uh, but seriously, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of affection for, for Ken, his experience, his guidance. Um, he's never mincing words. You never leave a conversation wondering where Ken stands. He's been a tremendous source of support and guidance, certainly for people like me. Uh, this is only my second term on council when, when I was new and the rest of us who joined in the last term learned a tremendous amount from Ken. Ken, we're going to miss you tremendously. We're going to miss your guidance. We're going to miss your support. And I think to a person, we wish you nothing but health and happiness for a very long retirement. Thank you very much for those kind words, Your Worship. Um, uh, yeah, I I tend to be a little crusty every once in a while. Um, uh, guilty as charged. That having been said, I can say this to all of you in all honesty, that uh, out of the 40 years, the last five have been the best. And for that, I thank all of you. Thank you, Ken. That's great. Very nice. Did you bring your bagpipes? No, um, no, 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 <laughs> no is the right answer. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get to invited presentations. And number one on the list, I have Chris Loretto, who is the uh, managing principal from Strategy Corp, who's going to give us a, a walk through the uh, kickoff for our strategic planning exercise. Chris, welcome. Great. Thank you, Your Worship. And thank you, members of council. And Ken, congratulations on your retirement. Uh, wish you all the best. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with Council again today, and, and I want to start by saying thank you to uh, the municipality for selecting us again to support you through your uh, next strategic planning process. We're very excited to uh, work with you again and uh, look forward to doing it in person this time because uh, the vast majority of it uh, was done uh, over screens, uh, given the circumstances of the last uh, few years. Um, what I'm here to do today is to do a, just a quick orientation for members of council on uh, strategic planning, what it is, what it isn't, and also talk a little bit about the process um, that uh, we're going to be helping you through over the next set of months in order to get to the refreshed strategic plan uh, for the municipality. And, uh, and then we're happy to answer any questions that members of council may have uh, as well to, uh, to, uh, to address any of your, your concerns or to uh, factor in your ideas into the process as we get it uh, underway. So if we go to the third slide with all our beautiful pictures, this is the handsome team of uh, consultants that uh, will be working with you to uh, support you through the strategic uh, planning process. Uh, I'll, I'll be the, uh, Chris Loretto will be uh, the engagement principal and I'll be responsible for making sure that uh, we do our job and do it to uh, the highest standards and to your satisfaction. And Olivia Lahai, who's with us here today, will be the project manager of working with the town staff on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we keep the trains running on time and that uh, we're executing against our project plan uh, to deliver the, the assignment on time and on budget. And uh, Jeremy uh, Kagunda will be our analyst on the file. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us uh, here today, but uh, he will be uh, supporting the team as we go about uh, doing great work with you. So I, I just want to, if we can go to uh, two slides ahead. Perfect. So um, as I, I, I know everybody's probably familiar with, but, you know, what is strategic planning? At the end of the day, what strategic planning all about is all about is about setting a direction uh, for an organization uh, and leaving uh, setting a direction so that, uh, you know, the, the, the management and staff team uh, can work with, in this case, council to figure out the precise exact ways we're going to satisfy that direction through budget planning, business planning, uh, and, and program planning uh, to ultimately, uh, the goal is to leave the organization and leave the community better off uh, uh, better off in five years time than uh, wh where it is uh, today. So it's about talking about where we're going, how we're gonna get there. Uh, it's also the value in a strategic plan is twofold. There's value in the plan itself in terms of setting that direction. And in a municipal context, that's important in terms of council 
uh, being very clear with the community and staff within the organization as to what our, our priorities are, where do we want to focus our efforts and our, our scarce resources to make the community a better place and to make this organization a more effective place. But there's also a lot of value in the process itself, uh, particularly in a municipal context. This is our opportunity uh, in addition to what you do every day and what you did through the election campaign to speak to them and really have that discussion about the future of the place. Um, it's easy to get tied up in the things that occupy our time and, and attention on a day in and day out basis, but a strategic plan really does provide an opportunity for you as council and, uh, and the staff that support you, but also for the community to say, you know what, let's take a step back and think about where we want to see the township of Muskoka Lakes you know, five, 10 years from now. And what does that mean in terms of the things that we need to focus on? And when we say focus on those, maybe things that will, you know, are already in the current plan and we'll continue to focus on those. Uh, they may be things that are new uh, uh, to us and, you know, will be new uh, measures that we look, uh, look at over the next number of years. Uh, or they may be things that, you know, we say, you know, maybe we need to stop doing those and take some of the resources that we have uh, in some of those uh, in some of those activities and redeploy it to things that you know we want to continue to do or new things that we want to start doing as a, as a municipality. So it's it's a very important document and it sets the stage for really what you're looking to achieve uh, as a council between now and the next election. If we can go to the next slide, why is strategic planning important? As I said, you know, it will sound like a, bro a bit of a broken record here, but it is about establishing that uh, direction. But we do that through being very clear about what our vision for the future of uh, this organization and of this community uh, is. And then we talk about the specific things that we're going to do. But then we're, we also talk about, you know, what are the values that are going to shape how we're going to make some difficult decisions and how we're going to work with each other and work with members of our community in order to make our strategy uh, a reality. Uh, it's also important in terms of making sure that, uh, at you know, there's so much that will come before council. And there's so much that is expected of a municipality to, to do on a day in and day out basis. It's very difficult to say no, uh, but a str strategic plan has the, if used properly, has the added value of being very clear about what the priorities are and helping to balance against competing, uh, competing, uh, competing uh, interests in order in order to focus on the things that are going to create the you know the greatest level of, of good uh, for for the community. Um, it also is important too, as we develop the strategy, and I think one of the you know key areas of focus that we'll have for this uh, time around is not just saying what we're going to do, but being very clear about how we're going to measure our progress and actually getting there. And so making sure that through this process that we are thinking about not only the things that we say we want to do in terms of are they smart objectives, uh, you know, uh, things that can be measured, but also being very clear with ourselves, okay, what are those measures that we're going to use to assess uh, whether or not we're achieving success and also how we're going to be able to make sure that we're being accountable to uh, to the residents of this community uh, put, who put us here to deliver on the things that we, that we said were strategically important to do. So if we go to the next slide. So as I said, you know, sometimes the question is, well, what's the relationship of the strategic plan to a business plan or an operational plan or the budget or the, the master plan uh, for this or the official plan, those types of things? Um, it's a very good question. Uh, there's lots of plans and strategies that are in a, in a, in a municipality's uh, toolkit. Uh, but we often like to talk about the strategic plan as being the kind of the, the, the chapeau or the umbrella uh, plan that is meant to say, here's what's strategically important. And so for all those other plans that we do, or those plans that we're going to refresh, it should take guidance from this strategic plan. And we should work to understand through, you know, those other plans and strategies, what elements of our, our priorities that we establish through the strategy are going to be taken on by those and really thought through for the purposes of implementation. And so it really does sit at the top. And so, you know, when you're thinking and as we're going through this process again, and this council or the previous council did a really good job uh, last time of really trying to connect the dots across all the various different strategies and plans that uh, it already had in place or the ambitions that it had around other things that it wanted to achieve, connecting those dots as much as possible through the strategy. So at the end of the day, we have things that are singing together as opposed to singing different tunes. And then that just at the end of the day means that there's a lot more clarity about what it is we're here to focus in on and how we're going to, again, allocate and focus our scarce resources in order to achieve, uh, in order to achieve 
uh, our objectives. And it's through those plans and through those strategies guided by the strategic plan itself that we then use that to inform the, the, the resource decisions that we make through the annual budgeting process and are actually putting money and people's time and effort against the things that we say are important for us to achieve as a community. So, you know, municipalities, if we can go to the next slide, municipalities these days are obviously under a lot of pressure to do a lot of different things and increasingly are being looked to to fill uh, vacuums that are created by more senior levels of government uh, in terms of the services that folks come to rely on or the solutions that they're looking uh, for to, uh, to, to solve some of the challenges that exist uh, in the community. But at the end of the day, a municipality can only do so much. So when we go through a strategic planning process, it's always important to think about those uh, things that are you know, before us in terms of uh, opportunities to uh, craft our strategic plan about what ultimately makes it in and what doesn't at the end of the day in, in terms of what is it that we do have control over and what are the things that we can't control? And obviously the things that we do have control over means that, you know, we either have the regular regulatory or policy authority, or we have the staff resources or the jurisdiction to do these, uh, to do these things. And so we can be more certain about uh, setting, uh, you know, kind of setting the objective and uh, you know, our, it's within our grasp to actually achieve success against that. Um, and those things are, you know, really easy to put in a plan, but there are always those things where, you know, it's not within our control, but we have a role to play as a municipality in this. And so uh, while we may not have full control, it's perfectly well that things may make it into the strategic plan um, where we need to work with others to advocate for our interests, or we need to lead or convene interests in order to come up with, you know, in order to understand what common cause we can develop in order to uh, then advocate for our interests and the interests of our community. And there's certainly things in the current uh, current strategic plan which were around advocating, uh, whether it was with the district or with senior levels of government, uh, around resource needs or the interests uh, of the community. One of the things that frequently is coming up uh, in municipalities that we work with across uh, across uh, across Ontario and ac across the country is around health care and, you know, increasingly some health care uh, requirements seem to be uh, you know, impinging on, uh, on municipalities and it's not your jurisdiction or, you know, the tax base wasn't set up to support those types of things. And so in a strategy setting, we don't want to ignore those, but we do want to understand what we can realistically do and where we want to focus our efforts in order to say to the province and, you know, in the case of healthcare, this is what our community needs and this is what it's going to take to address those needs. And that those are uh, very worthwhile things to make sure that we're including uh, in our plan, because as much as the strategic plan is about council and the four walls of this organization, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about the community and the community's needs and interests um, and uh, understanding those things that aren't totally in our control, but things that we need to have a say on and we need to advocate on is really important. Next, just a little bit about principles uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, if we can go to the next slide, sorry. Uh, just in terms of our approach to working with you on this, we wanna make sure that we, you know, we kind of help you deliver a plan that is anchored in five principles. One, that it's strategic, uh, not getting into the weeds. It's clear that it's setting direction, a plan that's authentic to you, uh, that, you know, uh, we really are trying to develop in the strategy things that are really critically important to you and to the future of the community. It's a plan that'll be implemented We'd like to focus on less. Less is more often in a strategy. It's not about creating a laundry list. It's not a to-do list. It's not a laundry list. It's not a grocery list. It is a strategic plan that sets uh, real focus and to be matched by resourcing. And we wanna ensure that the plan at the end of the day has confidence, confidence around this table uh, with you as council, confidence of the staff, but uh, just as importantly, confidence of the community in order to achieve that. And that's why we include council staff in the community in helping to frame and develop the, the strategic plan. So in terms of your worship, am I okay on time or are we? Yes, you are. Okay, I just wanna make sure. I know you guys have been working hard over the last couple of days. So I just wanna then uh, bridge into talking, uh, if we can go to the, the next slide after that. Thank you very much. So oftentimes it's, there's a question, whether it's in the municipal context, a private sector context, a not-for-profit context, who does what in the strategic planning process? Um, and so, you know, from our perspective and the approach that we take, we took with you last time and the approach we take with you uh, this time is, 
In terms of setting the agenda, we really believe that it's important that we see it as a shared responsibility between council and uh, the senior administration of the municipality, because, you know, your success is really going to be dependent on how how aligned you are in terms of what the priorities are and how you work together in order to achieve those. So as we're going through this strategic planning process, the, uh, the strategic planning process is about setting the agenda. It's going to be really important that uh, both sides are working uh, working together. The development of the plan, uh, you uh, will play a, a really active role in, but you know we'll be relying on the town staff and their expertise to really understand, uh, you know, what the capabilities and resources of the organizations uh, of the organization is, and and, and helping to frame uh, some of the choices that you're going to need to make through the strategic planning process. And so, in the development, working closely with town staff on a day to day basis. Um, is going to be important uh, given the needs around uh, data and understanding the organization and what it can do today and what it could potentially do tomorrow. Approval, that's all you, right? At the end of the day, the buck stops with you. The direction uh, is set by uh, this council table. Uh, but, you know, hopefully when it comes, you know, given the role that you're playing in the development, uh, hopefully uh, approval is a slam dunk, not to prejudge what is going to come out of this process. But again, if it's collaborative and all folks are all on the same page, hopefully the approvals are very quick. And then the implementation, you know, is left with staff. And you, what your job uh, at the end of the day around the strategic plan is to conduct that oversight and to make sure that, you know, in terms of everything that is coming forward, it, it, if it's aligned, that we are indeed doing things that are advancing things that we said were strategically important. And if not really, you know, thinking, uh, thinking through clearly, um, uh, you know, whether or not it's something that we need to be doing. And there are a whole bunch of things that are out of your control as a municipality in terms of what you have to do. You're legislated to do uh, certain things. So you're mandated to do certain things, even outside of legislation. So those are the things that uh, you have to do. But when it comes to competing interests, uh, where you do have discretion, you know, the strategic plan and your oversight of it is going to be a really important frame in terms of determining whether or not it's going to be something you put on your agenda as a council and as a municipality, or if it's something that may have to wait uh, for some time in the future. So in terms of the planning cycle itself, if we can go to the next slide, um, this is generally the, the approach that we're following in terms of our process with you this time, similar to the process that we guided you through last time, you know, starting with, uh, you know, a common fact base. And I know you've already started some of the brainstorming around this. And, you know, certainly you have a, a year, a little over a year under your belt and, and you have a good grasp of the issues that are facing uh, the, the municipality. But, you know, working together to really understand, uh, you know, the strategic and operating context of this municipality and what that means in terms of challenges and opportunities and potentially things that will need to be in the strategy are going to be really important. But also sharing that perspective with the community and using consultation with yourselves and um, members of the staff uh, and administrative team here, plus the community, uh, to further build out some of those things and thinking and see where we're coalescing around what we see as things that we want to pursue, things that we want to manage uh, down and, and just as fairly things that we no longer want to do and using that in order to develop the plan itself and, and, and taking that plan out once we have it and giving an opportunity before we're, you know, bring it to you to ask for your approval to see if the community says, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that makes sense that, uh, and we did that last time and quite, you know, it was a quite a good exercise and the, the good work that you did around this table strongly resonated with folks uh, in the community. So not, uh, not, just one day arriving with a strategic plan that is approved by council, but taking the opportunity to say, you know, we heard you, we've done our work, this is what we think it's going to be, getting community feedback and uh, validation and using that as part of your consideration around the approval. And then once you've done that, it really is the hard work of implementation. Developing the strategy is the easy, easy thing. Doing the hard work through budget processes and other processes and the the day to day delivery is absolutely essential to making a strategic plan come live and actually add value to uh, your community. Next slide. So in terms of our process working with you, um, there's four phases to it. We're in the first phase around the mobilization of uh, of the of the uh, of the process. Uh, next phase will be uh, co consultation. We're going to be setting up time with yourselves to do one-on-one -on -one interviews, and there will be workshops involved with uh, council and also talking to senior staff. We're also looking to engage the community through a survey and through focus groups um, and uh, through 
uh, pop-ups where we're going to meet folks <laughs> during their uh, uh, day in and day out activities. Uh, so instead of asking people to come to us and give us their two cents, we're going to go to them and uh, hopefully on the on the trip into the grocery store, or whatever it is, they'll, they'll they'll spare us some time to give us their thoughts on the future of the community, and we can factor that into our our work uh, in uh, with you in developing the strategic plan. Then we'll develop the strategic plan based on the benefit of that those that consultation and that input and the the shared knowledge around this uh, table, and we'll work to finalize it and uh, put together a plan that includes implementation for the first year and what kind of measures we're going to track in order to understand whether or not we're going in the right direction. If we can skip two slides ahead. Just in terms of the structure we of the strategic plan, we anticipate the structure is gonna be fairly similar to the plan uh, that, that you have now. Uh, the vision, mission, and values, what we're hoping to do through this process is, is validate those. A lot of work was put in. Our view is that vision, mission, and value shouldn't change every five years. Those should be the more timeless pieces of a strategy. A vision is about a long-term outlook and where you want to be in the future. Uh, the mission is what you do on a day-to-day -day basis as a municipality to actually achieve that vision. It, that shouldn't change a whole lot uh, from, you know, from planning cycle to planning cycle. And the values themselves should be timeless. Now, if the culture of the organization has evolved and you know, new uh, new values that are really genuine and authentic to the place need to be articulated. That's absolutely um, that's absolutely important to do. But what we're really going to want to focus our our time and attention on is okay, the strategic pillars that we have in the current plan. Do they still make sense? If they do, what then uh, in terms of what it is that we said we were going to do under the last council? Have we done what what still remains? Are those jobs that uh, or initiatives that we still want to undertake? Let's carry those through. What thing? What additional things do we want to start doing, and crafting those out? And again, it's not about you know a grocery list. It's about a tight set, a real you know tight set, focus plan on the things that we really want to achieve between now and the next election. And then uh, understanding those uh, initiatives, how are we going to measure whether or not we're uh, having success in that? And the strategic pillars can change. Strategic pillars can be added. Um, and so uh, that's, I think, where we're going to focus most of our time uh, over the next number of months together in developing the strat plan. So I'll conclude just by uh, saying, you know, you'll, you'll, if you haven't already been uh, reached out to, you will be very shortly in terms of setting up our time with each of you to do your initial interview to kind of kick off this process. I know some great work and brainstorming was done last night as part of your session. And so my understanding is that feedback will be shared with us as well. So look forward to exploring some of the ideas that came out of that session last night further with you in your interviews. And uh, in the interviews that we will be conducting with members of council, you'll, re you'll receive your discussion guide well in advance so you have time to prepare. We don't do pop quizzes or uh, surprise examinations. And so, uh, but if you don't have a chance necessarily to, to, to get to those questions, those are the questions we'll walk you through that day. And we're happy to capture your feedback that way. So your worship, I'll, I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions uh, that uh, members of council may have. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. Welcome back. Uh, oh, sorry. It's on now. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I'll say that for the benefit of the, uh, Zoomers, um, welcome back. I think there's uh, there's real value in having you return with your team and uh, the consistency and sort of an organic extension of what we've already done, I think is great. Anyone with questions? Councillor Zabitz. Uh, thank you, and through you, echoing your comments, uh, gonna be good to work with you again. It was a good experience last time. I guess uh, a question though to uh, the CAO, and, and that would be um, in the interest sake of are we and again, perhaps not a loaded question to you, but are are, are we as a township because we have not as yet spoken of this as a as an entity? Are we looking at this as a two point oh or a one point one? I mean, we worked as I recall very very diligently on the last uh, you know strategic plan. I guess I guess most councils would say they worked really hard. Um, I know I know we did and. And we came up with a document that uh, has stood the test of time and we've executed to it and continue to. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, and, I, and again, I don't want to get ahead of this whole process, but is this a 2.0 in your mind or is this a more, not more of the same, but an adjunct to where we came from to where we are right now? CEO Thank Hammond. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. So as Chris mentioned, I, I think, uh, 
you want to look at the entire document. Uh, I don't see fundamental changes to vision or mission. You, you know, as a council, you might, but you may, uh, you're going to want to explore all the goals and objectives. You know, what have we accomplished? Where can we go from here? Is there something that we've missed? Um, I, I've, there may be uh, things like if we're going to identify areas, are we prepared to fund them? And what's the relationship of the budget process, future budget processes to that? We also had some conversations about um, measuring our success as well. So I think there's a number of things that we can explore. Um, and it may be some of the same. It may be different. It's really in your hands. Councilor so Zavitz, you have a follow-up? No? You look like you do. <laughs> Thank you, it's through you. Uh, I mean, that is, that's the answer I, I guess I would have expected. This is a, a moving target. And um, I just, you know, as we get ready, I mean, I've made my date with your people for next week, et cetera. We all will. Um, you know, I, not that I want to be on the same song sheet, but I, I don't even know how to say this. You know, we have a, had a campfire where we've all sat around and said, are we aligned with our, you know, I guess we're going to find that out through this process. I know, you know, how hard we worked last and we had consensus. We saw it and, and you saw it and got consensus. And I, I guess that's sort of where I'm going. How do we come together as a group on that? So I... Mr. Loretto Letter, will likely elaborate on, on the opportunities to build consensus. But I, we started a bit of a kickoff yesterday in terms of just pasting ideas down. Those That information is going to be forwarded to him so he has the benefit of that. Probably use that as part of some of the questions that the, the team asks you. Thank you. And I would just say, Councillor, I think it's perfectly fair to treat this as an evolution as opposed to a revolution. Um, you know, and when you're, you know, an organization that's, you know, well practiced and you, you, you do strategic planning, again, over time, it becomes evolutionary, um, unless you're facing an existential threat, then you might need to re, re, you know, recalibrate and do something that is kind of breaks from the norm. But I would, I would see this as an evolution. And so we, you know, I would encourage you to keep the stuff that, you know, still remains relevant, keep it in there, but this is our opportunity to see those things. And, you know, since the last time we did this, these things have emerged. We need to, you know, think through whether or not we want to put these as strategic priorities um, against some of the criteria that Derek talked about. And if they meet the test, let's add them. Thank you. Anyone else with questions or comments or follow up to any of that? No, seeing none. <clears throat> Thank you again. Uh, great to see you and look forward to uh, getting to work. Yeah, great to see Thank great you. seeing everybody else uh, and uh, look forward to working with you. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Director Peroshi, we okay in there? <laughs> okay. All right, next up uh, on our list of uh, uh, invited delegations is a gentleman by the name of Stefan Kurzeknowicz. And he is with uh, Hemson Consulting. And first, you might want to start by saying how badly I mangled your name. No, it wasn't bad, Mr. Mayor. But uh, and, and you know, to be fair, the polls have trouble with it as well. So uh, no problems. Thank you very much. But my name is actually Stefan Chetronovic. Uh, and I, I am a partner with Hemson Consulting in Toronto. Uh, we were retained, uh, Mr. Mayor, by uh, the township to undertake a development charges background study. Uh, and I'm here to report to you today on the uh, preliminary results of that study um, and to talk you through the steps that are required to get you to considering a bylaw and new rates for um, Skoka Lakes. I have to say this is a kind of an unusual presentation that I'm doing right now in that the Minister of Municipal Affairs um, and Housing has just released at 1.10 p.m., a new housing bill that may affect a few of the things that I talk about in this presentation. I, if you saw me sort of rapidly texting in the background, it's because I was trying to find out uh, what the news release says. Um, and I think I know, but uh, everything should be caveated that um, this is sort of hot off the press. So um, if we could just go to the next slide. Oh, that's not it. Oh, 
are we able to close that? Um... Well, while we're working through that, I mean, I'll just go through our agenda. Uh, I do want us to take a few minutes and speak a little bit about the um, MUVIC target that is the development charges legislation that we're uh, doing the study under. It certainly changed quite substantially since uh, the last study you undertook in 2019 was done. Um, and as I say, there are some changes coming in today that uh, that if they're uh, if they're passed by the legislature will will change the way um, your new rates are, are approved and and how DCs are collected moving forward. I uh, certainly want to focus in on the background study results. And we are drafting the study as we speak, and we're hoping to release that on uh, Friday uh, on the website. And there'll be a public process to uh, to discuss those results uh, over the coming months. Um, and you will see in your package that we've calculated uh, preliminary development charge rates for you. Uh, they're quite significantly higher than the current rates you have in place. And I'll talk a little bit about why that's the case and show how they compare to uh, what other municipalities are charging. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? If, or, or do you want to take a recess? We're going to take a brief recess for sure. technical reasons. And we'll be back in uh, five minutes at quarter two. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Uh, Councilor Roberts, are you on? We don't see you right now. I just want to get going again if you're available. Otherwise, we'll there he is. Thank you. Okay, we're going to come back to order, please. And um, have we captured what, what's happened already? We don't need to start. Okay, then you just pick up where you left off, and I apologize again for the uh, for the technical issue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think we can start with the next slide, which is really just going to um, give you a very brief um, reintroduction to development charges and perhaps introduction for some of you who, who are, are new to this. Uh, we're talking about charges that are imposed on development to pay for growth-related capital costs. So capital costs only, not operating expenditures, um, and only to the extent that capital is needed to um, expand facilities, construct new facilities and infrastructure to meet the needs of growth and development in Muskoka Lakes. Um, the idea behind development charges is that growth should pay for itself so that uh, the cost of expanding services and facilities is not borne by your existing taxpayers. Um, just to be clear that the district has its own development charges, and it's doing a study right now um, to analyze uh, the appropriateness of those charges. Uh, there are school boards that also impose charges. This particular study that we're talking about today is only the charge, uh, the charges that are imposed by the township for its own services. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so development charges are imposed by bylaw. Um, and your bylaw was passed in 2019 and expires on July the 10th. It imposes uh, five charges uh, for library, fire, parks and recreation services, development-related studies, uh, and services related to a highway, which is your roads uh, service and your public works. Right now, those two charges are split. Um, moving forward, those will have to be amalgamated into one charge. The development related studies has an asterisk next to it because as of now, um, one of the reforms that, that took place over the last few years was to remove that as an eligible service for development charge funding. Um, we've calculated a charge for those studies because the minister in December committed to re or looking to re committed to consulting on reintroducing that as an eligible service. And I don't see that in the press release today. So we're a little bit uncertain. We intend to in include it in the background study and you can make a decision uh, when the time comes um, in July, when you make a decision as to whether that should, or whether you're allowed to introduce it into the bylaw. <laughs> Um, before you pass the bylaw, you have to undertake a background study. That's what we are working on, as I say, this week. And you have to hold at least one public meeting. Um, the bylaw, once it passes, will be a 10-year bylaw, uh, whereas the old one was a five-year bylaw. The, the new timeframes um, mm -hmm. mean that you can uh, keep the bylaw in place for 10 years. There's still a right of appeal of the bylaw and the rates for 40 days after you pass the bylaw, and those appeals are heard at the Ontario Land Tribunal. Next slide, please. Um, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the legislative changes uh, that have occurred uh, and that were um, released today. Um, so they've been quite significant in recent years. Um, they are a key component of this Conservative government's plan to address housing affordability in Ontario. Uh, in its last term, the government introduced a housing supply action plan, which I'm sure you're all aware of, um, as well as several pieces of legislation that were intended to limit development charges. Um, it struck a housing affordability task force whose recommendations in February 22, uh, 2022 in the lead up to the last election became a key part of its election mandate to improve affordability and to build 1.5 million uh, new homes in Ontario in, in 10 years. Uh, one of the key government aims is to reduce housing costs by reducing municipal fees and charges, including development charges. And to that end, it introduced legislation late in 2022. This was uh, so-called Bill 23 that implemented significant development charge exemptions 
uh, discounts and phase-ins. And on the next slide, I'm going to take you through some of these uh, some of these discounts and and exemptions and phase-ins. Some of them are in force. Some of them are not yet in force. So the first set of bullets there deals with the new exemptions. So there are provisions in the new legislation to exempt affordable housing and attainable housing from the payment of any development charges. Um, affordable housing is going to be defined if it's a rental uh, as within 80% of the average market rent, or below 80% of the average market rent. If it's a if it's a owner occupied home, it'll be eighty percent of the average purchase price, and there will also be income thresholds to the criteria for affordable housing. These are not in force yet, although the definition of affordable housing has been done. Um, the exact way this is going to work, and how those criteria are going to be applied has not been established. And I think the reason is that the province has been taking its time to ensure that there's a regional approach to assessing those average market rents and average purchase price, because obviously it varies considerably from place to place in Ontario. I understand that today part of the release uh, provides an enforced date or is proposing an enforced date for this particular exemption for June, June 1st. Uh, so um, I will check that for you. Uh, in the coming days. Um, the attainable housing uh, has not yet been defined, so we don't quite know what that is. Um, and my understanding is that that has not been included in the proposed legislation today. So that appears to be still being worked on by the province. Um, the remaining four bullets in that top uh, piece there are all in force. So where housing units are created in existing rental buildings, um, as long as it's up to one unit or 1% 1 of the existing buildings, they are exempt from development charges. There are also exemptions where units are created in existing homes, either through duplexing a home or triplexing a home or adding ancillary units that are separate from the main home uh, from the main, uh, the main unit. There are exemptions for nonprofit housing and for housing within inclusionary zoning areas. There are discounts that apply for purpose-built rental developments based on the number of bedrooms. So if it's a three bedroom or more, you get a 25% discount on the charge. If it's two bedrooms, it's 20%, one bedroom, 15%. And finally, at the bottom here, you can see that when you pass the bylaw, the rates that you pass, uh, if they are the maximum rates you could impose, there's a mandatory five-year phase-in of those rates. In year one, you can only impose up to 80% of the maximum rate. In year two, 85%, year three, 90%, year four, 95%. And then from years five to 10, only then can you implement the fully calculated charge. I understand that this phase-in has been removed from the bill that was proposed today. So if that gets passed, that will no longer be part of what you're dealing with when you pass your bylaw. Next slide, please. A few other changes that are, are perhaps a little bit less consequential. Um, <clears throat> there are some, as I mentioned earlier, there are some ineligible services now. The only one that matters for you is the growth-related studies. And as I say, um, um, I don't know whether those have been reintroduced uh, today or not. Uh, suffice to say that we've done the calculations for that service. Uh, it will be in the background study, and we will know by the time the bylaw comes uh, uh, to you whether we can introduce them or not. Um, there are some changes that will change the way we do the background study. So we have to look at service levels. Um, those, uh, the, the basis for calculating those service levels has changed somewhat. Uh, the life of the bylaw has extend, been extended from five years to 10 years. There are some changes to the way the, the charges are calculated when someone comes to the desk to pull a building permit. Uh, the rate they pay is the amount that was in force when they applied for their development. Uh, I understand there's going to be some changes to that um, coming out of today. 
There's a payment plan that is required if you're a rental or an institutional development. So their charges are paid in annual installments uh, for over a five-year period after the, the units are occupied. Uh, and then finally, for your roads development charges, there are requirements for how those funds are accounted for and spent. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the background study that we're doing um, um, is regulated by the Development Charges Act. Uh, so there are steps we have to follow in order to calculate the rates. Step one is to do a forecast of future development. Step two is to identify the additional infrastructure and facilities that might be required to service the additional development. Uh, step three is to look at uh, the levels of service that you've been providing in the past, because that will set a limit on how much you can fund moving forward. Um, we're then left with the costs that you can consider for development charge recovery. Uh, we have to um, review the costs remove any costs that are going to benefit your existing residents, remove any costs that can be funded from external grants or subsidies, remove any costs that can be funded from existing development charge reserve funds that you have on hand, and remove any costs that might benefit development beyond the time frame that we're looking at into the future. But ultimately, the costs that you can recover are charged um, on a per unit basis for residential development uh, and on the basis of new floor space for non-residential development. Next slide. Uh, this table just summarizes the development forecast that we've used to calculate the rates. Um, the forecasts are being done at the district level. Um, and so, um, they have been released in draft, and we will use the. If they get updated over the coming months, we may update um, the rates for you. But right now, uh, yourselves, Bracebridge, and Georgian Bay, whose bylaws expire in the coming months, uh, we've used the latest and greatest information that's been available, may, may, been made available at the district level. Um, and for Muskoka Lakes, uh, on the housing side of things, it's about 43 new units a year that are being forecast. Um, that's a little bit lower than what's been experienced in recent years. Um, so certainly between 2016 to the 2021 census, there was um, you know, a higher rate of growth than what's being anticipated moving forward. Uh, and it's certainly a little bit higher than what was assumed in 2019. It includes both seasonal and permanently occupied residences. So both of those housing types are liable for the development charge. And then on the non-residential side, the, the forecast is premised on about 50 new jobs per year, um, uh, which is a little bit higher than what was assumed uh, back in 2019. We are looking at a 10 year planning period for establishing the charge, uh, which would start this year and end in 2033. Next slide, please. We've spent a lot of time uh, in discussions with staff um, on uh, establishing a growth-related capital program for each of the services. Uh, the important thing uh, for council to understand is that the capital program must reflect your intentions to maintain service levels in the face of a growing community. So there are some items in the capital program that were not included in 2019. Um, and um, particularly on the parks and recreation side of things where you've done a parks and recreation master plan. Uh, and we'll talk a little, we can talk a little bit about those items uh, in the coming slides. Next slide, please. This table summarizes the, the costs of the program uh, by service. Uh, and I'm just gonna go from left to right uh, and sort of identify the various breakdown of the costs. So you've got the services on the left uh, that we've looked at, uh, the gross cost of the program. So it's a 10 year program and it's $32 million of growth related capital. Um, we haven't identified any grants or subsidies or other recoveries uh, to, to pay for the program. So the cost of the municipality is, is the 32 uh, uh, million. 
uh, a significant component, about a third of those costs, um, can be attributed as benefiting your existing residents. So those have been removed from the development charge calculation. Additionally, uh, the municipality has about just over $1.2 million of development charge reserve funds to pay for those costs. Uh, so those reserve funds have been allocated uh, to the program. Um, and then if you skip over to the last column on the right, you can see for parks and recreation, um, a significant amount of the cost uh, has been considered to benefit development beyond 2033. Uh, and the reason for that is that the single biggest um, cost item in this list is the provision for a 25,000 square foot recre in recreation facility. Um, and that's probably a generational kind of expenditure um, and certainly will benefit the community well beyond uh, the, the next 10 years. Uh, so we've assigned a, a sort of a post-2033 benefit uh, for a significant portion of the cost there. But the 2024-33 column is the, is, are the costs that are being brought forward to the development charge calculation, so just under $8 million. Next slide, please. Um, so the residential charge, as I mentioned, is imposed on a per unit basis. There's a higher charge for the larger unit types um, and then a smaller charge for your apartment uh, units. And that's based on the number of people, average number of people living in, in those units. Um, and then on the non-residential side, it's, it's a single flat rate. It's been calculated across all um, non-residential uh, types. Next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this uh, just summarizes the residential development charges that we've calculated. And you can see on the left there, uh, these are the charge charges per unit. So for a single detached unit, it would just be over $17,000 a unit, uh, about $11,500 for a, a row house, um, nine, $9,500 for a two-bedroom apartment or, or larger, and then for a one-bedroom apartment or bachelor, uh, $6,242 per unit. The pie chart shows you how the charge breaks down by service. So the most significant component is that parks and recreation component uh, of well over half the, the, the total charge. Next slide, please. This table compares the charges that are currently in force in Muskoka Lakes with the newly calculated charges. So the first column of figures on the left there is your current residential charge for a single detached unit. So it's about four and a half thousand dollars. So the newly calculated charge at seventeen thousand dollars, quite a substantial jump in the uh, in the charge, should you implement it. Uh, and if you look at the difference and and where the major differences are, uh, there are increases across the board, um, mainly because I mean that's and it's really a reflection of you know, the cost to build facilities and infrastructure has changed dramatically, as I'm sure you're aware, since 2019. So that's what's driving a lot of this. Uh, but on the parks and recreation side, you can see there's a significant increase in the charge. And that is because of the introduction of this facility, which was not there in 2019. Okay, I should just point out one other matter, and that is that the current charge that's in place has not been indexed since it was passed in 2019. So you have an indexing provision in the bylaw, but, it, but you, you haven't sort of invoked it since then. A lot of other municipalities would do that. So um, uh, it, that charge is sort of, has not changed despite the, the inflation that's occurred over the last five years. Next slide, please. Um, the, as I mentioned, as we speak, um, the phase-in still applies. So. Uh, for a single detached unit, it's a $17,000 charge that would not be implemented until five years' time. So in year one, it would be a $13,500 charge, and then it would phase up. But I understand that today's announcement would remove the phase-in. Uh, so there is a, a possibility, um, should you impose the full charge, that you could, you could actually impose that when you pass the bylaw. But more, more to come on that. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this graph uh, here just compares the current charge and the calculated charge with some of the charges that are in place in uh, your uh, municipal neighbors, um, both within Muskoka and in some parts of northern Simcoe County. Um, so the first thing here to understand is that the this is the total charge that someone would pay at the counter. Uh, so the, the portion in green is the upper tier charge imposed by the district or, or the county of Simcoe, and the portion in gold is the, the lower tier charge. Um, and uh, you can see that the current Muskoka Lakes charge is at the bottom of the, um, of the chart here um, at just over $21,000 per single detached unit, and most of that is the district charge. And most of the district charge, by the way, is for water and sewer. Um, and the newly calculated charge in Muskoka Lakes would put you up to the upper end of the range. Um, that's the year five charge, though, remember. Uh, year one, the year one charge would be a little bit closer to what's charged in Aura Medante. Uh, one final thing just to point out, I suppose, is that you're certainly not unusual in dealing with significant increases in your development charges, potentially. So if you look at George and Bay, their current charge is uh, sort of in the middle uh, of the uh, of the chart here. It's $23,700. The new, newly calculated charge is pushing them up to $27,500. And if you look in Bracebridge, uh, where we've just released a background study, the current charge is down at the bottom of the list. And the newly calculated charge in Bracebridge would put them among the highest charge, if not the highest charge in, in the district. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Just on the non-residential side of things, the, the newly calculated charge is just over $52 a square meter. Um, it's only for three services, for roads, fire, and the studies. Um, and as I say, the studies may have to come out, um, depending on the announcement today. Um, we don't consider um, the need for parks and rec and libraries to be driven by anything other than the residential sector. And so we don't calculate a charge, um, a non res charge for those services. Next slide. Uh, this is just comparing the current and calculated charge. So looking at the bottom there, it's a $20 per square meter charge right now. So a 50, just over $52 a square meter. Certainly a significant jump, but uh, not the same kind of order of magnitude that we see on the residential side. Uh, the next slide then uh, provides you with the same comparison. Uh, so again, the current Muskoka Lakes charge is you know, fourth from the, the bottom there. Uh, the newly calculated charge, if you impose the full rate, would sort of still keep you in the mid range, but certainly a bit higher up uh, of the com comparators. Uh, but again, a couple of points is that you're not alone in dealing with increases on the non-residential side. Um, and moreover, in Gravenhurst and Bracebridge right now, they don't impose a non-res charge at all. Uh, they exempt all non-res development from, from payment of these charges. Um, and then just the final, just to wrap up, um, we will, um, over the coming month, be um, releasing a, a, a draft version of the bylaw. Um, and uh, we will need to sort of restructure the bylaw somewhat to reflect the changes arising from Bill 23 and potentially the changes arising from today's announcement. Uh, and we will have ongoing discussions with staff about, you know, definitions of development in the bylaw and make sure that they are aligned with the district bylaw and, and the other uh, bylaws in, in, in Muskoka. Um, you do currently have exemptions in place. I think we can skip to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, you do have exemptions in place for um, where certain kinds of uh, redevelopment occurs. So if somebody demolishes a home and rebuilds it within three years, you exempt them from development charges, which is a very common kind of exemption. Um, but we will have to make sure that all of the current exemptions tie in well with, with the new mandatory exemption framework that's been imposed. And then finally, if we can just uh, go to the last slide here just in terms of our time scale here. Uh, as I said, we will be releasing the background study uh, this Friday, um, and it will have the, the, the draft rates that we've shown you today. Um, 
we uh, have ear earmarked a, a, a public meeting to discuss the background study findings for May the 15th. And so I will return to you for a similar presentation. And of course, um, happy to answer questions from the public uh, arising from that meeting. And the idea would be that we return to council um, at some point in June. I think there's a council date that's scheduled for June the 12th for considering the bylaw, uh, but that would still leave you a few weeks, um, indeed almost, almost a month before the bylaw expired, should you wish to hold a further public meeting or, or have further council consideration. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I think I went slightly over time, but I'm happy to answer. No, you, you weren't on a time that we invited you. So thank you very much and apologize again for the delay. I, I have some questions, but I'm curious to know, we'll let anybody else go first. Does anybody else have any questions or uh, Councillor Bozemorth? Thank you, and through you. Um, I, I take these are essentially inflationary increases or? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So it's, it's a bit of both and it depends on the service. Uh, so um, part of the increase on the roadside will certainly be inflationary. So to the extent that the cost of, um, you know, steel and concrete and, concrete and bitumen uh, has increased significantly over the last five years. If it was the same project in 2019, it's the same project now, the project cost has gone up and so will the development charge. But it's not quite that simple. Um, there will be changes to the development forecast uh, that change the way the rate is calculated across the board. Um, and I, I would say most significantly, there are one or two additional projects that are being contemplated this time around that were not being contemplated in 2019. And the two I would highlight would be in the parks, the parks and recreation, the indoor recreation facility. And there's a provision in the library for facility expansion. Um, whereas in 2019, we were only considering the funding of additional collection materials. Thank you for that. Any other uh, questions? All right, I'm gonna expose the fact that I don't know much about this. Uh, you mentioned in the second last slide exemptions and on the list of exemptions were TML, the district, and my question is, is that the, does that mean that if we develop uh, a parking lot or build a new piece of infrastructure, the township itself is exempt from paying uh, development charges? That's correct, Mr. Okay, that's number one. Uh, number two, you also mentioned some time ago that we haven't actually stepped up or phased in, I think was the word you used, over the last few years to the maximum amount that we could actually have been collecting and I'm curious to know, is that a statutory amount? Is it a negotiated contractual amount or is it high to COLA or what, what is that number? Yeah, so Mr. Mayor, this is within your discretion, um, but you are permitted under the act to index the rate through your bylaw. And there's several ways of doing that. You can um, put an automatic index into the bylaw uh, where it happens automatically you can you can put one in that requires uh the treasurer or someone else to come back to council every year and review it and and vote on it uh, i'd have to check your bylaw to see the exact wording to see the mechanism but the act permits you to do it and it prescribes an index for you to use when uh, actually making those changes Perfect. Then the last question and is really more of a political question than anything when we when we call for a public meeting uh, I'm going to guess that I don't know how we call for it. If it's just sort of by posting it online and, or do we target a specific group of people who would be most likely affected by development charges? Because I'm thinking that if everybody on our mailing list gets a note that we're going to deal with uh, development charge increases and not bother to read the fine print, the immediate assumption is here we come again with our handout for more taxes. I'm just curious to know how we, how we, how we explain the nature of a development charge to somebody who immediately reads it as a tax increase. Yeah, Mr. Bear, that's a very good question. So um, first of all, there's a requirement to post an ad uh, and that is the minimum requirement. Um, and the ad has to be posted in a newspaper of general circulation. Uh, and if you don't have one, it's been problematic. I understand that I'm just reading part of the announcement 
is that one of the proposals is to remove the requirement for posting ads in newspapers of general circulation. All you have to do is on the website. Now, that may, that may not be enough for you. You may wish to do more. Um, some municipalities will approach you know, local chambers of commerce, um, building and construction, large developers, contractors, uh, and send them um, specific notices. Uh, so I don't know whether you, how you engage with those groups, but uh, to the extent that you do, you might want to use those avenues to uh, let them know over and above the, the statutory public notice. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mazan. Thank you. And through you, uh, this kind of ties into your last question, but it is specific. I note under the current exemptions, and I just want clarity, it's for demolished and rebuilt within the last three years. So is this primarily targeted at new builds, like completely new builds? We have a lot of redevelopment that happens here. Are they excluded from this? Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, it's t the, the exemption is um, targeted at redevelopment, but that can take many different forms. So um, if you're um, you know, demolishing something on Main Street in Port Carling and, and, and rebuilding within three years, to the extent it's like for like, then you would be exempt. Similarly, if it was a cottage on a waterfront if you demolish the old cottage and rebuild a new cottage within three years that would be exempt so it's intended to provide a credit for the like portion of the new property so if you built two units where there was one you would get a credit for one unit and you don't have to pay one development charge thank you just a quick supplement so go ahead. it's just as we think about communicating this out. I think that actually is ties into what the mayor was just talking about is clarity around who this impacts. Uh, because for most of us, we wouldn't fully understand that, I don't think, and it could get perceived. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you and through you, and I guess I'm gonna be inappropriate because this won't be a question, but we have hel held public houses. This is not new to us in Muskoka Lakes. And we have had held public meetings at the community centers. And we didn't specifically target any one group because everyone's affected. Like everyone's affected. So. Thank you for that. Um, anyone else with a question? Nothing. All right. Well, thank you very much. Good luck on this mission. And I'm sure we'll see you back here again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, we're going to move to item number uh, six, which is public comments with a cap of five minutes each. Uh, the first one is uh, Peter Hungerford, who is agent for uh, Averbuck regarding agenda item 11.a.1 and 11.b.2, uh, specifically relating to additional application information. Coming online, is that it? There we are. <clears throat> Mr. Everbach, can you hear me? Um, good afternoon, it's uh, Peter Hungerford, uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. You're right. Mr. Hungerford. Yes. Um, okay. All right. I don't know if You've got a presentation to... loaded up and is someone going to control? Yes, I, I think that's okay. true. Um, do you have me on video? I'm not sure if you do or not. We can't see you. Okay. I don't sure why that is. What we can see is the bones of your of your presentation, so maybe you need to minimize it. So, uh, 
Perhaps I can just continue um, without video and uh, with my presentation. I know I only have five minutes, if that's all right. Uh, sure. Now, we're not hearing you very clearly. Can you either move the microphone closer or? I have my uh, volume up full. If I speak up, is that better? <clears throat> it's a little bit better. Can we be, can okay. I can hear? Can everyone hear? All right. Thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Kelly. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Council members, and staff. <laughs> Excuse me. My name is Peter Hungerford. I'm a senior planner with Marie Poirier Planning and Associates, and our corporate address is 44 King William Street, Unit A in Huntsville. And we are appearing this afternoon on behalf of our clients, Mr. and Mrs. Averbuck, who own the property located at 1683 Brackenridge Road. And the purpose and effect of this matter before council is to finalize a site, a site rezoning to recognize a number of non-complying regulations for the existing structures on the property. As council probably recalls, the property was acquired by our clients back in 2017 after the lot was fully developed and having inherited these non-complying issues, this rezoning will bring the property into conformity with the current zoning bylaw. The planning merits associated with the application are outlined in the number of staff reports that have been provided to council and uh, support the staff's recommendation for final approval. Additionally, Mr. Mayor, the application is supported by a number of environmental reports that have been prepared, reviewed and endorsed by our own consultants and by peer reviews completed by an environmental consultant that was retained on behalf of the uh, on behalf of the township in accordance with the council's prior direction. Uh, the recommendations uh, that now are put forward forward before council to provide for extensive remediating works um, will uh, address the shortcomings in the area of the property uh, along the shoreline buffer. Our client retained a qualified landscape consultant, Muskoka Landscaping, to prepare detailed landscaping plans to illustrate the revegetation proposal for the shoreline area and the finalized plans are included in the materials provided to Council in support of the application. Uh, council can have reference to the four plans that were uh, provided. I think the first plan would be um, drawing number L1.1, if that slide could come up. And this plan, um, Mr. Mayor, shows uh, changes to the terrain, essentially the removal of rock areas uh, located in front of the existing uh, bunky um, and in front of the existing gazebo along the shoreline. Excuse me. Additionally, removal of a portion of the patio located between the gazebo and the shoreline. And also in the beige, uh, in the beige areas, it shows the uh, location for the installation of core logs that would uh, assist in uh, dealing with the uh, topographical change on the uh, property and uh, assist in our planning plans. We could go to uh, the next slide, uh, L1.2. There are three slides, uh, Mr. Mayor, that um, are provided. This one um, uh, just uh, shows a location of trees that are to be uh, planted along the uh, front of the property. And in the uh, top right-hand corner of the plan, there's a list of those uh, trees. I think there are a total of uh, 20, pardon me, 52 trees, um, a combination of both uh, deciduous and coniferous trees. Um, and you'll see that they are spread along the, uh, the length of the shoreline. The next plan, um, sheet L1.3, shows uh, the location of a number of shrubs that are also uh, proposed to be installed on the property. Um, there's a mixture of shrubs that are, are there. They're detailed in again in that uh, schedule in the top right corner. And uh, I think there's something in the order of 150 shrubs that are to be installed. Um, I guess the next uh, 
slide at L13, <clears throat> excuse me, is the uh, the last uh, planting plan, and that shows how uh, a number of perennials will be distributed um, across the uh, across the property. I think in total there are just over four hundred um, different uh, trees, shrubs, and uh, perennials that are proposed uh, to be uh, installed along the uh, the face of the uh, property uh, to affect the renaturalization of the area. Mr. Hungerford, your five minutes is just about up. If you could wrap, please. I will. Thank you. Planning staff have recommended approval of the uh, of the rezoning and the preparation of a site plan agreement that incorporates the recommendations and the site uh, improvements that have been shown on these plans and referenced in the staff reports. So in closing, Mr. Mayor, I would like to thank Council for its consideration of uh, this matter. My, client, my clients are anxious to bring these matters to a conclusion and to proceed with planned improvements to the property. That would be um, that would be my submission, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hungerford. Um, before you go anywhere, I'm going to ask if anyone on council has any questions. I'm seeing not. Oh, uh, Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. I'm not sure that my question is through you to. Um, Sorry, I'm not. Um, if it's you, you to staff or to Mr. Uh, to the agent, I, I'm trying to follow these patios, and then I see that we've got trees in the patios, the stone patios, but the patios aren't being removed. I'm I'm not I'm not following how this is going to happen. Yes, I did. did you, thank you. The uh, the intention is uh, to remove the stone patios, portions of the stone patios that are shown on Plan L one point one, and um, all existing trees are to be um, are to be retained. So it may be just the way they appear on the drawing. Uh, Councilor Nishikawa, another question. Thank you. Well, as through you, and I guess maybe I would be looking at staff. Um, what I'm, I've only seen in the wording is removed patio, and in the red zone, um, whereas it doesn't say removed patio anywhere else that I can see. Correct, right, Mr. Okay. Mayor. There's a first. There's a portion of the patio between the gazebo and the shoreline to be removed, and then the blue area between the area of patio being removed and the shoreline shows existing rock, which is to be removed and, repla and replaced with plantings. So that whole area between the the, the hard the hard if the hardscaping, if you will, between the uh, gazebo and the shoreline is being substantially reduced by the removal of a portion of the patio and the existing rock on the shoreline and its replacement with a uh, number of plantings. Uh, might I suggest this is, well, this is coming back to us uh, with the staff report in about three items down the agenda. It, it might I uh, suggest we get into this at that time. Uh, does anyone have, uh, anyone else have any questions specifically for Mr. Hungerford? Um, seeing none, thank you, sir. I appreciate your input. Thank you, Mayor Kelly. I appreciate it. Uh, now, next we have, uh, by virtue of the supplementary agenda, item 6B, public comments, five minutes from Mr. Brian Hansen, who is here uh, on the same matter, uh, item 11.A.1, ZBA 57 slash 22, Averbach, part of lot 27, concession five parts, two, five, six, eight, and 12, plan 35R-23401, Watt, Roll number 2-9-087, specifically to uh, address item 11.A.1, ZBA 57 slash 22, Averbach, part of lot 27, concession 5, parts 2, 5, 6, 8, and 12, plan 35R-23401, Watt. Roll number 2-9-087, specifically to uh, address item 11.A.1, ZBA... 
I, I think, um, man, that guy talks a lot. Can we uh, cut the sound out of? Oh, thank you very much. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm not. Mr. Hungerford, Hungerford, or somebody's got, I think, the YouTube. Oh, Mr. Hansen, sorry. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? So, I can hear you, but but we can also hear what sounds. I'm sorry that that, that was me. I, I think. Okay. I, I, so it's off now. Sorry. All right, that's good. It's off. That's cool. Okay. Okay. Uh, so as I, I was I was saying, I'm not going to repeat it all. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Hansen to address uh, these issues uh, right now. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll be very short. Can everyone hear me? See me? We can hear you. We cannot see you. We can't see me? Okay. We can see a presentation. It looks like our own uh, agenda. Um, hmm. Can't hear me. Okay. I, I, mean, I think you're broad I think you're broadcasting fine. It's just that you've got or somebody has got what looks like the agenda for this meeting posted in front of you. Uh, yeah, I think you've got that up. So we're looking at the agenda that's on your screen as opposed to you. Yeah, I don't need that if that's being done for me. That's better. Okay. Ready to go? You're uh, yes sir, you have 5 minutes. Okay, I'll be short. Um, I've reviewed the renaturalization report. It states that it only addressed improving water quality. Those are the words it used. Um, it doesn't address the excessive hardscape, including the hot tub and associated bylaw and building permit violations. Um, and as a quote from the minutes, uh, the council directed a review and consideration by a professional of a reduction in stone patio size and other hardscape works within the shoreline be undertaken and added as a component of a renaturalization plan. So I'm a little confused as to why they've stated they only uh, focused on water quality. I, I have seen they've removed a, a couple stones and a thin slice of the gazebo patio, but they didn't address uh, the excessive hardscape that uh, Councillors and and we have uh, talked about. So I, I would like for someone to speak uh, to that. Um, I will refer to a few pictures in the presentation, which I was not permitted to present last meeting for uh, alleged inappropriate and offensive material, which is now uh, acknowledged to be false. And I like that to be for the record because I had to be put through um, being... Um, uh, alleged that I had uh, put forward that presentation. So just for the record, that has now been acknowledged to be false. So the renaturalization report says the stonework is within the footprint when the Averbucks acquired the product, the, uh, the uh, building property. That's incorrect. Could you please turn to page 221 of the pictures or of the agenda? Page 221. Okay. So you can see the massive, on the top picture, you can see the massive walls um, that have been constructed there. If you turn to page 223, you will see a much smaller footprint um, in the patio and you will not see massive uh, retaining walls. So it's not correct that the uh, uh, statement made by the consultants that's within the footprint, it's not within the footprint um, and it never has been. The renaturalization plan recommends planting some caliber trees in front of walls. The problem is, is that first of all, a few trees will never hide such massive walls and it'll take 10 to 15 years for these trees to grow. Um, at which point they're going to be so, then at that point, they will be large enough so that the leaves will be above the walls. So we're not going to solve covering the walls long term for our generation, our grandchildren's generation, by keeping these walls in place and uh, using this 
you know, um, uh, strategy here of, of, of you know, putting a couple of caliper trees in front. And we and our neighbors have been looking at this for five years already, and we just don't think it's fair for us to wait any longer. The walls are not in compliance with the 50-foot bylaw, and we have bylaws, as we know, to be complied with. If we could turn to page 55, please. Oh, sorry, do I have the wrong page? I'm looking for the page that has the renaturalization plan by um, the consultant, the four pages that he just showed. Are we able to find that or? Um, page page 45, is that what we're looking for? No, I, I thought it was 55, but no, it's not 45. Oh yeah, sorry, there we go. Could we just go down a bit, see one of the other pictures? Keep going, keep going, keep going. One more. Yeah, right there, right, sorry, that one. So you can see that um, on the west side, there's no protection of the walls. And on the east side, there's no protection of the walls. Now we live and view to the east. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the decision ultimately is gonna be here, uh, but uh, at a minimum, the walls should all be uh, covered with trees and shrubs. So. People on the Mr. Hanson, Mr. Hanson, you have 30 seconds. Please uh, wrap it up. Okay. Uh, let's go to page 153. Okay, so I don't really understand why, if part of the patio is being removed there, I don't really understand why not all of it is. It's not in compliance with the 50 foot bylaw. And um, uh, I would like to hear about the staff about the rationale for why there's the hot tubs not being re relocated, patio size not being reduced, and retaining walls aren't being um, removed. Good landscapers can repair any damage done by any any of this stuff. Thank uh, you very much. Your time is up. Okay. Um, where are we now? Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Hansen? He's still here on uh, the phone with us. If we have any questions. I'm seeing, oh, sorry, Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. Well, Mr. Hansen mentioned, and I kind of remember the presentation when this first came forward last year, that in fact, these changes um, were not what they purchased that in fact more had been added on since they had purchased. There's a question for Mr. Hansen? Yes. Okay. I, you know what? I can't even remember what I was going to say now. No, it's just that I, you know, Mr. Merritt, I, if I wasn't interrupted. I'm just clarifying that you're asking a question to Mr. Hansen. We have a debate coming up about the merits of the case. Okay. You asked me if I was asking a question to Mr. Hansen and I said, yes. Fair enough. Uh, anyone else? So can I ask a question of Mr. Hansen? Well, you said you'd forgotten, but sure, go ahead. Uh, the floor is yours. Sir, you had said that what was on the property when the people purchased it was not what we see today. Is that correct? And That's what correct. has changed? That is correct. That's correct. What, so, what are the changes? So the patio has been enlarged. Um, both east, west, and uh, south. The large retaining walls have then extended the patio even beyond the original footprint. Those big, large retaining walls that you see, those are all new. There was, uh, as I showed in the one picture, maybe didn't have time, page 223, um, you'll see the Jennings had one uh, stair going down to the lake. The Averbucks have put two stairs. 
uh, down there, um, which is, you know, unnecessary for that size of property. Um, and uh, um, I'm just thinking out loud here that the uh, tr trussel, what's it called? The trestle or the trussel um, that's on the east side, that was built. Uh, and that's not, they didn't get a, um, that's not uh, bylaw um, compliant. They built the sun deck, which extended the patio out even further um, within the shoreline buffer, I think 35 feet instead of 50 feet. And then they put a hot tub on top of it, which the hot tub is also uh, around 35 feet within the shore. So uh, violating the 50 foot shoreline buffer. Those would be the, um, well, then they put the rocks in front of the, um, Bunky, which the staff has um, recommended they remove, which is a good suggestion, and rock down by the um, water, which they have. And then they've clear cut a whole bunch of trees, and they've clear cut a whole bunch of trees in the back, which again, the, the report hasn't addressed. So I think if you just give me 30 seconds, I'll see if I can remember anything else. Um, Okay. Um, while you're thinking of that, do you have any follow-up, uh, Councilor Nishikawa? Okay. Uh, Councilor okay. Zavitz. Uh, thank you, and through you. So as I understand it, we've been looking at this file for quite some time now. Uh, we've already done first, second reading. Uh, this is third reading relating to site plan control. I guess I would either look to um, Ms. Crowder or uh, Mr. Pink. Um here we are. I mean, these questions, this sort of a, a status as to where it was, uh, really can't affect my decision here today. I have to go with, I think I have to, you know, support staff and their findings. So I would ask either one of you as staff, uh, how did we get here where this is third reading? I want to support it. Uh, I think it makes sense. You obviously have done your homework. So one of you tell us, uh, you know, we, we're only taking away so much of a patio, the hot tub stays where it is, et cetera, et cetera. How did you come to that decision clearly, uh, if you might articulate that? Thank you. Uh, if I may, maybe I'm off base, but we're taking submissions from both sides today or right now. And in about 20 minutes, after a bit of a break, we're back. We'll have received the uh, staff report and we'll have lots of opportunity to push and ask questions at that time. Anyone else with a question or comment for um, Mr. Hansen? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your input. Uh, and we will uh, move on. I think that's the end of the delegations, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. All right. Um, if this comes up a bit later on, I'm going to suggest we take 10 minute break till 10 minutes till to three. Uh, we're going to come back. We haven't done consent agenda. We've just done the delegations. That's where we're at now. We're finished with the delegations. We'll do consent agenda. Then we'll start moving through these reports, including the uh, staff reports on this particular file. All right. So I'll be back here at 10 2.
Okay, uh, we're going to come back to order. And uh, out of an abundance of caution before we move on to the consent agenda matter, I am going to inquire, um, based on what you saw on the agenda, whether anyone has any pecuniary interest which they wish to disclose. Seeing none, I will assume that the answer is no. Thank you very much. May have missed that earlier in the uh, presentation. Sorry, let me get glasses on. Okay. Um, all right. We're going to move to the uh, approval of the consent agenda, um, and particularly considering a resolution to deal with uh, four or five specific sets of minutes. Um, why don't I just read the uh, minutes? Unless I think we've had, did we have one pulled out back in? Okay. Yeah, uh, I had, I had, uh, Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I'm Gordon Roberts here. I had uh, wished to pull one from last month's planning meeting. Have you been here? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I have a resolution that recognizes that. Thank you very much. Moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved that the mayor and council adopt and enact the following minutes and recommendations contained in the April 10, 2024 consent agenda and direct staff to proceed with all necessary administrative actions. Number one, March 13, 2024 general and finance minutes and action items one through six. Number two, March 13, 2024 council minutes. Number three, March 14, 2024, Planning Committee Minutes and Action Items 1 through 5, with a note that Action Item 6 is to be pulled and voted on separately. Number 4, uh, April 3, 2024, uh, CAO Interview Committee Minutes. And number 5, April 4, 2024, Special Council Minutes. Does anybody have any uh, issues with any of those recognizing that we are pulling uh, action item six on the March 14 planning committee meeting and we'll be dealing with it separately? All right, then I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, that carries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, I'm going to read the resolution and then we can have a discussion about this. Uh, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor McIntyre. Um, number three, March 14, 2024, Planning Committee Minutes, Action Item 6. Be it resolved that Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application ZBA-06-24, Lily R. Holdings, Inc., be approved, subject to a revision in the amending bylaw permitting only an unroofed and unenclosed pergola. pergola. So uh, before we go... Uh, to call the vote on that or ask for a vote on that. Um, we have some discussion and Councillor Roberts, I think you want to take the lead on that. Yes, thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, it, I will recall, recall that this application was just pointed out, this application was defeated at last month's planning committee meeting. Uh, subsequent to the meeting, I reread the application, uh, watched the meeting video and contacted staff for further clarification. It was, it was it is my understanding the application was defeated for two reasons. One, some thought that the staff report did not adequately justify the reason for allowing the one percent additional lot coverage, and some thought that that and and that some thought that in the future someone other than the current property owner would add a roof to the pergola. Um, it is my opinion that um, staff uh, uh, did on at the March meeting. Uh, did communicate uh, verbally the reasons for their support of the application uh, during the dialogue that uh, occurred. Um, in summary, it is my understanding the reason for staff supporting the 1% relief uh, were that the, the lot coverage out, uh, overage will not dominate over the environment and the goal of ensuring the environment continues to, to dominate. Staff's opinion is that wholesome, healthy, <clears throat> Vegetation buffer does get, doesn't get much better than what is on this property. Uh, staff also have mentioned that staff opinion is that the members of the public passing by via boat will not be able to tell that the property has additional coverage permissions. Uh, um, three, 
staff's opinion is that the design of the boathouse is quite modest in size in comparison to what the, what could be built as a right without coverage exemptions. And finally, four, the subject proper, property, which is located on uh, Lake Rosso, um, will will not be out of character with the area. Um, as for the uh, the per uh, I would like my my peers to reconsider this and um, uh, the, their the vote of last time, and uh, possibly uh, we could um, suggest or recommend that the pergola be removed and not not allowed. So um, I maybe I should ask staff if they would like to add. Uh, or if I had missed anything or misrepresented their the, my understanding of their position. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I, I'm looking for clarification on this request. Um, I feel strongly that um, with the material in front of us, when we made the decision, um, and in fact, I would suggest even some material was missing that I would expect to see if I'm going to have to vote on this again. Um, but also the people that attended the meeting are not aware that this is being pulled back again. So how is this a public decision if, if in fact, we're not including those people that were that took the time to be part of the, this uh, application? Uh, it, it's a very good question. I'm actually going to look to Director Proshi to answer uh, the public nature of this. This is within the per is this within the purview of our um, ability today? Um, thank you through you, and I'll, I may look to Director Pink to answer that. But I, my understanding is that we have a, a obligation to hold a public hearing, which was done at Planning Committee, and then after such time, it's. The decision of committee and or council and how they uh, see through that decision but i will uh, refer to director pink please all right thank, uh, thank you through you uh but proshi is is correct uh, under the planning act you're required to hold a statutory public meeting which has been held uh, there's no obligation to hold further public consultation however should uh, council wish to reconsider that decision one option is to uh, revert the application back to planning committee for further discussion where those additional details that I think Councillor Nishikawa is looking for can be discussed. And also staff uh, can notify uh, previous owners that were engaged that the matter is returning uh, for future discussion. Thank you for that, Councillor Kent. Sorry, I preemptively put my hand on. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Kelly. After that planning meeting last month, my first reaction, and I went to Rob and asked and Councillor Bosworth and asked him this question, which was, did we just turn down the 11% or the 10.5% increase and the pergola? And the answer was, by the way we did the uh, approval last time, we did turn down both items. And I, I think that the issue was that they were tied together. And I, I guess that meant that they would have to come back if they just wanted to get the 10.5%. And I thought that's what was going to happen. They're going to come back for that. And we had turned down the, we turned down the pergola, but I didn't know that everybody although there was lots of discussion of it, I think we generally were not objecting to the 10 and a half percent. So I'm just asking for a clarification again, because we're now bringing it all back. And I question whether it's really the their responsibility to come back and say, I want my 10 and a half percent, I'll leave the pergola off. And then at that point, we could, could change our minds on that if that's what we choose to do. Thanks for that, so Director we, Pink. Uh, thank you through you. I, I think Councillor Kent's understanding is correct. The way the resolution was read, uh, it was both matters. So both requests, one for a lot coverage, one for the pergola uh, being combined uh, as it was defeated, both were defeated. And I believe you have correspondence from the applicant's agent. Uh, I can't speak for a committee, but there did seem to be some general uh, more support for the lot coverage request. Uh, and I believe the correspondence or the agent is suggesting that perhaps uh, solely that matter could be uh, considered as opposed to having to defeat the application and start from scratch with a new application. And again, I think the options before you are either to uh, return to planning committee uh, to discuss that, or uh, we could consider uh, through the clerk uh, potentially uh, going to uh, May Council uh, with the revised bylaw. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Nishikawa. Hey, uh, Director Pink, through you, uh, no, I'm just asking you, Director Pink mentioned that there was 
further correspondence. So did the, did this applicant ask for this to come back? Um, because I remember during the meeting that we actually asked the applicant whether he would split split them up, and he wouldn't. And as a matter of fact, he was pretty hard nosed about going to be uh, his design, right? And so I, I'm I'm concerned that the applicant didn't come back. The applicant hasn't come and said unless there's some letter sent in, because that's what I think I might have heard. And I and I'm very concerned that if if someone just contacts one of us as the council, because otherwise I could be coming here every council meeting and asking for reconsideration. So I'm very concerned about what slippy slopes we're taking. So uh, to you, Director Pink, just to sort of paraphrase, did we receive correspondence in the nature of uh, a request to reconsider? Uh, through you, that was my understanding. I looked to Ms. Crowder and Mr. Sharp, but I believe the applicant's agent did send correspondence to all of council. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Crowder. Um, thank you. Through you, um, Mayor Kelly, uh, a, a letter was sent in um, to myself and we did forward it to um, members of council. And that letter did um, request that consideration be given to the proposal again, if not in its entirety, um, then, you know, uh, the lot coverage. I have had correspondence with the agent and um, he has expressed to me an interest in in proceeding with one of the exemptions, if not, if both are not acceptable, then proceeding with one. And um, I know that in previous um, councils, we have approved certain exemptions um, and, and denied others. So I think that option is before you. Uh, okay. Um... Anyone with other comments? I'm going to have one at the end, but uh, Councillor Bosenworth. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kelly. Um, I actually supported staff's re report and their conclusions at the planning meeting. Uh, I think they were appropriate, and I think both variances, uh, the pergola and the 10%, uh, should be allowed. Uh, that said, um, certain. Certainly, from the community's point of view, uh, they were they were very adamant about this, and it seems to me that the best process on this, in the interest of the applicant and the community, would be to send this back to planning. Any with uh, other comments uh, that they want to make, Councilor Nishikawa? I just want to understand when I get a letter from somebody, am I supposed to be now the champion to come back to council and say? I want to champion this every time because I'm very concerned that's the direction that we're going. Usually things are done through the clerk's office or planning. And then, you know, because we all get lots of letters, but do we then all just raise our hands and say, are you going to go and challenge it for, for this guy or am I? Like, that's not council's role. Uh, I, I Whether it's our role or not, I do recall that the letter was actually addressed to planning, so not. Uh, I can't remember how it was set up. I saw it. I didn't. Uh... Um, through you, Mayor Kelly, let me just check quickly. I'll see who it's addressed to. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kent, did you have your hand up? Yes, thank you. Follow up. Just Councillor Roberts, what was your interaction on this? Did they, did they, the owner call you and how did you become the, 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 the applicant or the applicant's um, discusser here for a change in and it's not, a, I don't have any problem with it. I just want to understand the history there. Sure. And that was a Are question you... for Councillor. Oh, uh, sorry, Councillor Roberts, I didn't see that. Sorry, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, no, this was all my own. Um, I immediately, um, that weekend after the planning meeting, I I went through a staff recommended um, approval of the one percent relief. I heard their reasons why. Um, I, I I thought you know as we we are going against staff recommendations, so I wanted to really fully understand uh, or uh, reevaluate my decision. I went through the uh, as I said, I reread the report. I went through the video, and then I followed up with staff. And um, yes, uh, in my opinion, the staff report was light on the actual justification 
of um, A and B, if you remember, there's three components, A, B, and C. The pergola, they had more justification. So, but but going through the video, I, I did hear um, the reasons for, um, uh, so, you know, reconfirmed my, my uh, support of the application on, on the, uh, on it. Um, the second part on the pergola, um, we cannot, I, I, I believe I should not make a decision on ifs and buts that someone would cover a pergola. So um, uh, this is why then I, I reached out to uh, staff. I got further clarification on it. And this is why I um, decided to ask for reconsideration. And in summary, uh, staff has, has supported this. I think they have given um, uh, just reasons for it. And um, I, I, I asked that it be reconsidered. Uh, there was no contact with, uh, uh, with the agent. I did read his letter. Um, I did question some of the things he put on it, but that's not for me to question uh, publicly. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm going to um, recognize uh, Councillor Mazan has her hand up and then I'm gonna ask a quick question and then see if we can move this forward. Uh, thank you and through you. Uh, just given even today's discussion, uh, I would concur with uh, Councillor Bozemorth. It feels like there's enough questions on this particular application for it perhaps to go back to planning. Uh, hopefully we've all had a chance now to look at this particular file in a meaningful way and uh, and hopefully we can bring some closure to this property at an appropriate <laughs> process. So I would support that recommendation. Thank you. Um, did you want to ask a question? Uh, thank you. Through you, is there any way that we can get this onto the planning agenda for tomorrow? Seeing it'll be fresh in our minds. Certainly, um, you know, I, I think for me, part of the issue was the covering of the pergola, and I can't, in all rights, say that that's going to be done. And what I do understand now much better is that if uh, someone was to do that, it would be a planning act violation. Uh, not a bylaw, and that the fines are $10,000 a day. So I'm quite convinced that um, that we can, you know, we can move this along, but I'd love to see it go to planning. But if we could do that and get it onto the a supplementary onto tomorrow's agenda where it's all fresh in our minds. Let me take a stab at this because I'm going to leave everything open but timing. Um, here's where I'm at. Uh, I, I have a reasonable concern that we either made a decision that we didn't understand at the time or uh, somehow got lost in the language and didn't realize exactly what we were voting for. In the normal course, if one or two people were wrong and it went, you know, eight to two, it, relatively inconsequential. In this particular case, it only takes one person on on the uh, on council or on the, the committee, you know, voting with a misunderstanding of what they're voting for or why they're voting for something um, to crater this thing, because it was, as I recall, a tie vote and, and, a, and a loss because of the tie. Um, so I, I also believe that, I mean, from my perspective, unless somebody can speak up, I don't think there's anything wrong at all with the process that, that we're currently in the middle of. Uh, we do have the right to pull this stuff for reconsideration and discussion. Uh, Councillor, uh, uh, Roberts has done that, uh, has done his homework to understand, you know, exactly what the situation was at the time that we vote. I think in my mind, certainly he's raised a reasonable doubt about how we got here. I think it's a doubt that deserves to be reconsidered and uh, and revetted. Um, and the only thing that I would suggest is um, as much as I'd like to do it quick, I'd like to do it right more. And I think that means spending a little bit of time with this report. Uh, bringing it back next month. And my first question is uh, maybe instead of bringing it back to planning, uh, if we have an opportunity to refresh memories and take another look at the report and bring it back directly to council, can we speed the process up for the sake of the applicant who is probably eager to get a decision finalized and move forward? Uh, you, Councillor Bozemore. <laughs> uh, uh, through you. I, I think we should bring it back through planning because that's a public meeting. And given the um, sensitivity of the neighbors in, in this area and their deep interest, uh, if we brought it back to council, that would not be a public meeting. They wouldn't be able to participate. I'll, I'll uh, sorry, uh, 
Director Pink, or oh. you both had your hands up. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to reaffirm your earlier comments, the uh, I would echo those. The the pause or the delay between a planning committee or any committee and council is intentional. It's not meant that every recommendation from the committee is a is a fait accompli at council. Any councillor has the ability to pull any action item for further discussion, as, as Councillor Roberts has done, whether that's new information or a further reflection. Uh, with respect, just to clarify uh, Councillor Bosenworth's comments, uh, the public meeting has been held. Uh, council could direct, should they wish, that a further circulation be provided and a formal public meeting be held. Uh, but then we might be looking at a further delay. Staff would have to prepare that notice and meet the statutory timelines. Uh, that might be possible for May, uh, but we're sitting here in April and there's again the statutory timelines. I will leave the decision as to the process up to council, but again, I think this could return to uh, planning committee next month or directly to council next month. We could, uh, again, if directed, uh, advise uh, through either of those routes, uh, those neighbors who were previously engaged that the matter is returning and they would be permitted the opportunity to delegate should they wish, as would the applicant. Uh, Councillor Kent. Um, I thought it was the, 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 and this is through you to Director Pink, isn't it the applicant's choice what he wants to bring back to planning committee? So he's, I guess, had some correspondence with you guys, rather than just taking the exact, the file the way it was presented before, he may choose to only come back with 11%. Um, he's seen the meeting, he's heard the discussion. I thought it wasn't really our choice to bring it back. I thought it was his choice. Uh, Director Pink, uh, through you, the mayor. I believe ultimately it's council's choice. The applicant has the right to either formally amend their application to remove the pergola, uh, if that is the concern. I don't have the letter in front of me, and I don't know if they chose that option. Uh, but ultimately, I think what they're requesting is essentially a further reconsideration of it. I believe their impression of the discussion was that uh, committee was generally supportive of one aspect of the application and they may be comfortable moving forward. Whether they formally amended the application or not, um, I'd have to review the correspondence or, or perhaps staff can confirm. But uh, in essence, it's up to council now to decide whether you wish to reconsider the recommendation of committee, whether that's the entire app or just portions. Um, and again, what form you wish to do that. Councillor Kent. Just one question is, if they then bring it forward exactly the form it was before, do we have sure. the choice of including one versus, or do we have to do it on mass? That was why. I Sorry, I thank Director you for Bank. you. I was, uh, I meant to respond. Thank you for that. Uh, that's correct. Uh, if it does return or reconsidered, council uh, and planning committee have the option to approve either or uh, as they as they wish. I, I, again, I'm going to go back just to finish off timing. I think next month is good. I I don't think that there was a breakdown in communication from uh, from the public. I don't think there was any misunderstanding from staff in the staff report. I think yours truly and the rest of, of the committee are the ones who probably created the confusion and, and made the mistake. So from my perspective, bringing it back to council, giving notice that we're coming back, if someone wants to come and delegate and speak to it, they can, giving us a fresh kick of some time with the, uh, with the report, um, and hopefully trying not to engineer, uh, you know, new resolutions in the last minute, which I think is sometimes our downfall too. Um, Ms. Crowder, you have a. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mayor Kelly, you just, you'd asked a question or somebody had asked a question at some point about who this letter had been sent to. I just wanted to confirm that the letter was sent to myself, but it was addressed, um, dear members of council. So we did send it to all the members of council. Um, and I guess I would just um, ask for some clarification because I know a few members have expressed desire for more details on on why staff have recommended approval. So if that's something you would like, perhaps we could look at doing a report to council. So if you could just advise on that, I can proceed. Thank you for that. Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. I'd like to see a survey. I'd like to make sure that um, the lot lines are lined up. So I'd like to, I'd just like to see a survey because I'm suspecting that everything's pretty tight. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to ask, as I don't know, does the survey exist? Do we know, or is that something we would have to be commissioned? Through you, Mayor Kelly, um, staff have a site plan. I don't believe we're in receipt of a survey. We could ask the agent if they have um, a survey that's been done for the property and where, if that's where the numbers have been derived from. But 
as of right now, I'm not in receipt of a survey. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Director Proshi. We have. So we'll have another resolution. We'll read it if there's any debate or discussion uh, at that point, and then we can decide how, if we're going to move this forward and how and when it, it comes to us. It is. Okay. Uh, what I have in front of me is moved by Councillor Bosenworth, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Number three, March 14, 2024, Planning Committee Minutes, Action Item 6. Be it resolved that Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application ZBA-06-24, Lily, excuse me, Lily R. Holdings, Inc., be postponed to the May Council meeting. Um, anyone with comments or questions? Uh, Councillor Mazan and Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, and through you, I just would like to have clarification that when it comes to Council next month, there will be staff reports and the ability for staff to be able to help guide the discussion again to ensure and that the two components are going to be included. Director Pink. Certainly do that, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Zavitz and Councillor Bosom. Uh, thank you. It's for you. Uh, here we are in the front of the public and we're admitting, uh, yeah, I heard your words that we, you know, we made a mistake last, last month uh, and I, I take umbrage with that certainly. And, and I, I think too, that, um, you know, there's, if there were 10 people around this table, whether there was 10, eight, nine, um, I'm pretty sure how I voted and, you know, <laughs> to bring this whole thing back together again, now we're starting to question this and that, and the other, it's almost like if we're going to pull an item like this, we should be able to watch the video and we should know who voted how we should know the number at least of who voted for what was it five five if it okay well so you know um right on the line right and so you know I, i've pulled these items out myself before as well and i know you have to be very well prepared or it can go nowhere right and so in this case um i think we spent a lot of time on this file we still are and we voted the way we voted. So, I mean, I'm in support of not bringing it forward next month. Thank you. Uh, that's fair. And the only uh, comment I would say is it was not a recorded vote to my recollection. And so uh, it, it, it failed is all I know. Uh, Councilor Bosenworth. Um, I may have misspoken. I just wanted to be confirmed that when we bring it back to council that the community will be able to have a voice. Director Pink. Members of the community uh, would be able to delegate uh, to council if they meet our procedural lines. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, all right. We'll say all opposed. I can't do the math. It carried. It did carry. I missed something. Then. Yeah, it did carry. He voted for, right? Yeah, he voted for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So it'll be on the agenda for next month uh, for council. All right. Um, we'll do that one more time. If there's some doubt or discrepancy about what just happened in the vote, we'll call the vote one more time. And um, we can even do it on a... Just, just call the vote one more time. Is the only option to bring it back to the councilor, or is the other option to bring it back to planning? Because I would have, I'd approve going back to planning, but I don't approve going back or, to council. Right, or accept it the way it is. So the reason yeah, I voted the, the option before us is bringing it back to to council next May, uh, next May, uh, next month. That's what we're voting on. All right, one more time because of the possibility of confusion around the vote. All in favor, and hold your hand so I can see it. One, two, three, four, five. All against, one, two, three, four. That carries. Thank you very much. Okay. Boy, we've gotten through the consent agenda. Uh, next item on the list is Earth Day activities. And I think uh, we have some, uh, we're, can call this back to order, please. Welcome. Mr. Moore. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. I will be quick. 
Uh, coming up on Monday, April 22nd is Earth Day. Um, and uh, we just have a few initiatives that we will we'll be undertaking in regards to that. The first is the Clean Muskoka Together uh, project. This is actually a district initiative, um, but it allows members of the community that wish to hold a community cleanup the opportunity to sign up at the district and receive the supplies required to do so, garbage bags, gloves, etc. That program is actually available all year round if those are if there's anyone interested. Um, and the uh, the form to sign up for that is on the district of Muskoka website. But uh, over the next couple of weeks, we will be promoting that. Uh, the second piece is the compost pickup. Uh, we do this annually and uh, beginning on Earth Day itself, compost will be available for pickup at our three public works yards. And the last initiative is, uh, is new this year. We're actually going to be hosting some community cleanup events ourselves. Uh, so we'll be uh, in Port Carling in the morning, Bala in the afternoon, helping to clean up the, uh, the downtown areas. Uh, we invite anyone from the public to come join us in doing so. Um, no need to sign up or anything. Uh, the uh, locations are Hannah Park at 10 a.m. and the Precambrian Shield in Bala at 1 p.m. And uh, I know our communications officer is uh, beginning to distribute all the information and promotions, et cetera, about all three of these initiatives beginning today. So you should see some uh, information start to hit your email boxes, social media, et cetera. Uh, so with that, Your Worship, any uh, questions? But uh, happy to answer some uh, offline as well, too, if there are any that pop up. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Does anyone have a question? I do, but uh, does anyone else have a question? Uh, you may have met, I may have missed it. Is the district waiving dump fees on Earth Day? I don't know about all dump fees on Earth Day specifically. I know if you sign up through the program they have, the bags that they provide through that program uh, have a tag to waive those fees. So um, I know ourselves, we've signed up for that program for those two community cleanups. So um, that's when the fees can be waived is through that program. Thank you very much. Okay, that's it. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Okay, uh, some items of business uh, from the manager of public works. Mr. Sopko is coming to the mic. First of all, number 10A, uh, granular material supplied and delivered. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you don't know what's coming. Anyone with questions? No, I'm seeing none. I'm going to read a resolution. Uh, moved by Councillor Burry, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa. Be resolved that Council Award Contract T-2024-26 to Weeks Construction Inc. for the bid price of $90,992 plus HST. And that the Director of Operational Services be authorized to execute the necessary documents to proceed with the foregoing contracts. Any questions? All in favor? That carries, thank you very much. Okay, so next uh, report we have is for the award of a tender for supply and stockpile winter sand to our the lowest compliant bidder. And with that, available for questions. Uh, any questions on the supply of winter sand? Okay, I'll read. Oh, sorry, Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, it's for you. Just wondering, what do we do with all the sand that's uh, on the roads when we collect it? What, it? Where does that all go? Question. Through you. So all the sand as it goes on the roads, it's, it's contaminated material. We we test it. We, we stockpile it, test it, and then we send it to Rose Warren and Phil. And that's unfortunately because it's it's been on the road, it's contaminated with uh, various things from, from you know, oil spills to gasoline to... Salt that sort of thing. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, read the resolution moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor McIntyre. Be it resolved that Council Award Contract T-2024-27 to Fowler Construction Company LTD for the bid price of $156,930 plus HST and that the Director of Operational Services be authorized to execute the necessary documents to proceed with the purchase. Any questions? All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Next report is for the supply and placement of dust suppressant. 
uh, again, the awards to the lowest compliant bidder uh, available for any questions you may have. All right. Any questions? That's the present. I'll read the resolution. Moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Zabitz. Be it resolved. The Council award contract T-2024-28 to Miller Paving LTD for the bid price of $117,960 plus HST and that the Director of Operational Services be authorized to execute the necessary documents to proceed with this contract. Any questions? All in favor? That carries. Thank you. And the final report is for an award of a contract for a new compact pickup truck for the building department. And again, it's uh, the recommendation award is for our lowest compliant bidder. Available for any questions you may have. Uh, any questions about a mountain pickup truck? Uh, Councillor Bosenworth. Uh, can you define compact for me? Is that like Ford F-150 or Sierra 1200 or are they smaller? No, it's like a, for you, it's a, like a Chevy Colorado, Ford Ranger, that type of vehicle. So I'll read uh, another resolution. Moved by Councillor Burry, seconded by Councillor Bosenworth. Be it resolved, the Council Award Contract T-2024-30 to Gravette, Chevrolet Buick, Cadillac, and GMC Truck LTD for the bid price of $47,400, less the value of trade-in, taxes excluded, and that the Director of Operational Services be authorized to execute the necessary documents to proceed with the purchase. Any questions? All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, who's this, Miss Crowder? Are you speaking on this one? All right, welcome to the podium. Thank you, Mayor Kelly, and good afternoon, members of council. Zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 5722 in the name of Averbuck was heard by planning committee on June 15th, 2023. As council may recall, the purpose of this application was to recognize several as-built buildings and structures on the property. On June 15th, council gave first and second reading to bylaw 2022-192. Third reading of this bylaw was withheld until council was satisfied that the recommendations of the updated water quality impact assessment and peer review response were satisfactorily implemented and that consideration of a reduction in stone patio size be undertaken by a qualified professional. At that time, site plan control was not an option due to provincial legislation, so committee opted to withhold third reading of the bylaw. Given that the ability to impose site plan control for this property is now an option, staff are comfortable with third reading of the bylaw being given today, provided a bylaw is passed to designate the property as subject to site plan control. This bylaw is on the agenda for later today. Since first and second reading of the zoning bylaw, a reduction of 100 square feet of the existing patio is proposed and 75% of an area at the immediate shoreline with rock boulder fill in front of said patio is to be removed. Please note that schedule two to the bylaw currently indicates proposed granite treads five feet in width. Staff reached out to the agent for the application to inquire about what this is. The agent has confirmed that the proposal does not involve the installation of new steps, and the agent has advised staff to remove mention of this from the documentation to be included in the notice of passing or notice of refusal stemming from council's decision, whichever the case may be. Please also note that the staff report indicates that securities should be held until such time as a certification letter is received to certify that the required works have been completed as recommended by Mikalski Nielsen's Associates Limited and Hutchison Environmental Sciences Limited, and upon satisfactory monitoring for a period of 10 years. Staff would like to clarify that we are of the opinion that securities can be returned after the certification letter is received and does not need to wait until after the 10 years of required monitoring is complete. Staff have no further comments at this time, but are happy to assist council with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crowder. Does anyone have any questions um, about the report? Councillor Bosomworth. Uh, thank you, and through you, um, it was nine months ago that this was before planning, as I as based on those dates, uh, and I do recall some discussion about 
uh, further remediation that might have included the walls because I, I think the walls were added and they were concerns. And we had a, a, a member, a neighbor mentioning those walls. Can, can you remind me the discussion we had? Because it was fairly extensive discussion and I think we all went away feeling comfortable, but I just would like some clarification about you know why those a lot of those walls are still there and maybe another clarification around the hot tub as well. Ms. Crowder. Thank you, through you, Mayor Kelly. Um, at the time that this application originally came forward, I was not the planner handling the file. So I can't speak exactly to the conversations that happened at that meeting, although I see Mr. Sharps here, so I'll let him respond if I don't cover off some things here. But essentially my understanding is that the um, water quality impact assessment that was done by Mikowski Nielsen's and Associates and um, the peer review response from Hutchison Environmental Sciences um, determined that removal of those walls um, would result in more negative impacts than potential renaturalization of the site. So the reports um, recommend a substantial renaturalization plan. And after the, um, the, the first and second reading of the bylaw were given through um, peer uh, evaluations of the proposal. Now a total of 410 plantings are proposed. Um, that's 52 trees, 150 native shrubs, and 208 perennials. Um, and I know that the report also recommends some strategic placing of those plantings in front of the retaining walls to help sort of buffer the, the visual appearance that they may have. Um, I see uh, Mr. Sharp has disappeared, so hopefully I've answered that. <laughs> Mr. Sharp, I don't see him now. Welcome, Mr. Thank you, Sharp. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kelly, and uh, good afternoon, members of council. I think uh, Ms. Crowder did a, a great job of summarizing uh, how we've gotten from point A uh, to B. We were uh, sent away um, with direction from council when the bylaw was given uh, first and second reading um, to review and consider a uh, reduction in stone patio size and other hardscape works. And that review and consideration were, was to be done by uh, qualified professionals. Uh, the applicant uh, has retained um, Mikowski and Nielsen's associates, as we know, and the township has retained Hutchinson Environmental Sciences Limited as our uh, peer reviewer. And um, the peer reviewer, Hutchinson Environmental Sciences Limited, is satisfied uh, with the landscape plan um some uh a portion of a patio um in proximity to the gazebo is to be removed as well as um some rock work or rock uh, boulders in front of the gazebo and they're in front of the sleeping cabin there's also some rock uh that is to be removed thank you thank you uh councillor bosomworth just a supplemental what what would discussions did we have about the hot tub because it is within the uh, 50 foot setback thank you yes and thank you for reminding me uh councillor uh bosomworth um i would just uh uh, uh clarify that there is uh an as-built sun deck that is in front of you today it's uh part of the uh, proposed bylaw uh the required exemption is for the uh, front yard setback so if that uh, exemption is removed or uh, uh, approved. Um, the hot tub would be permitted to be on the sun deck as of as of right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Oh, Councilor Roberts. Sorry, I didn't see you waving there. That's okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I hope I haven't. I haven't. I hope the staff hasn't communicated this and I missed it. But I'll ask the question just in case. Um, we know we wanted a reduction. We asked for a reduction in the hardscape. What percentage of reduction uh, occurred with this uh, new plan? Thank you, uh, Ms. Crowder. Uh, through you, Mayor Kelly. Um, so there is 100 square feet of the patio that is um, in front or between the gazebo and the um, the lake that is to be removed. And 75% um, of the rock um, fill that's in front of that patio toward the shoreline is also to be removed. 
Thank you. Councilor Roberts, does that um, answer your question? Yeah, I'm just wondering if it was a, like, okay, so I've got the two numbers. I'm trying to get, get in my mind. Is that a significant amount or is there still a significant amount of hardscape left? Um, you'll recall that um, uh, the uh, Mr. Hansen said there was there was a lot of um, of um, or in, in his in his uh, opinion there was a lot added after uh, uh, by this current owner, and um, I'm just looking for a, a, you know an idea of how much was written. We got a lot of trees, my goodness, 400 odd trees, but how much hardscape was really removed? So I don't know Mr. what I can get an answer to that, but go ahead. Mr. Sh Mr. Sharp, I see you're back. Would you like to take a shot at that? Sure, thank you, uh, Mayor Kelly. I think as a percentage of the whole, in other words, of 100% of the hardscape uh, features that exist on the property, we're not sure. We don't have a percentage confirmed. I would look uh, perhaps to the applicant's agent if he is still here and able to speak. Um, but I would note that on uh, page 153, of your agenda package, um, the areas of hardscaping to be removed are identified in blue and red. So there's a, an existing patio uh, in proximity to an existing gazebo that uh, part of that patio is to be removed. And then there's a rock in front of that patio uh, identified in blue and it is to be removed. And there's a uh, sleeping cabin uh, toward the, uh, uh, the bottom left of the uh, of the drawing I'm referring to on page 153, and you'll see that there's some uh, rock identified in front of that area that is to be removed uh, as well. And uh, as Ms. Crowder had indicated, uh, there's a fairly significant amount of uh, plantings that are proposed, um, quite uh, uh, quite far in addition to uh, what was previously uh, uh, proposed when this matter was in front of uh, council the last time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I see people are calculating. <laughs> Councilor Nishikawa. I spoke on this before through you. Um, it doesn't say that on the site plan very clearly. In fact, it, it says on the red area to be removed, but the blue area doesn't say to be removed. Well, you got to go, let's go to the fine print, like all of that. But in fact, that's what concerns me that in fact, um, you know, our bylaws, anybody that's going out there and they were looking at that drawing, it doesn't say, it just, it's, it's yes, if you find, go very far. I found it interesting that they said to be removed on the red areas, but they don't say that on the blues very clearly. And that's when I, when I spoke before about the number of trees that they were planting and how they were doing it in the hardscape. So I just want clarification so that it's not that we know what we're voting on and that we're not getting something, you know, a year from now because it wasn't noted on the site plan. It's a good question. I think uh, Ms. Carter had her hand up to help. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Kelly, to Councillor Nishikawa. Um, if you take a look at the page it's labeled um or it's on one page 153 yeah and if there's a legend on the right hand side and it shows the red uh the red detailing and then the the blue detailing and it labels them as removed patio and removed rock and then there's some labels that are pointing directly to those features on the site plan and um it also says proposed patio removal and proposed rock removal and um this would be um, attached as a schedule to the site plan um, agreement if said site plan bylaws passed later today at today's meeting. this uh, That's how this would be incorporated. It, it's not very clear about the percentage, but I guess. Uh, anyone uh, with other comments, with other questions? Councillor, oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Um, Mr. Sharp. Thank you for indulging me, uh, Mayor Kelly. I would just clarify uh, upon reading the, the fine print, um, Councillor Nishikawa, um, within the blue areas, it indicates that approximately 75% of those areas are to be uh, removed. Thank you. Thank you for that. Oops, sorry, any other comments? I, my mic was off. Um, 
I'm seeing none. Do I have a resolution? Oh, we're going to bylaws. Okay. Ah, sorry, we're in the first level. Okay, so I do have a resolution to read at this point. Uh, I think moved by Councillor Bozum, or seconded by Councillor Kent, be it resolved that bylaw 2022 192, Averbach, roll number 2 9 087, be read a third time and finally passed. Does anybody have a question at this point? Anybody with a comment? Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. I will not be uh, in favor of this today, and I'm very concerned that we haven't dealt with those walls. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, anyone else? I'm seeing none. I'll call the question. All in favor? Um, I think one, two, three, four, five, six. That carries. Six. All against? No. Okay. That carries. Thank you very much. Okay, we're moving on to the next item, uh, 11A2. Uh, Bracken is the name, and uh, I have two resolutions to read. Moved by Councillor Burry, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa. Be resolved that bylaw 2024-041 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14, Bracken, roll number 7-12-010-04. Be read a first and second time. Anyone with any questions? There's no report on this. All in favor? Thank you very much. That carries. And then next, uh, moved by uh, Councillor Zavitt, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be, as, be it resolved that bylaw 2024-041, Bracken, roll number 7-12-010-04, be read a third time and finally passed. Any questions? All in favor? And that carries. Thank you. What am I on next? Propeller. All right. Two resolutions under uh, sub three on 11A. Um, no presentations. So uh, moved by Councillor Burry, seconded by Councillor Kent. Be it resolved that bylaw 2024-040 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 Propeller Fine Homes, roll number 6-24-036-05. Be read a first and second time. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. And again, uh, moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Bozumworth. Be resolved that bylaw 2024-040. Propeller Fine Homes, roll number 6-24-036-05. Be read a third time and finally passed. <clears throat> All in favor? That carries. Thank you. All right. So where are we at now? Any presentation on this one? No. Okay. All right. This uh, this one is moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Kent. Be it resolved that the original road allowance lying in concession E. Lots 30 and 31 in the former town of Ma township of Medora, now in the township of Muskoka Lakes in the district municipality of Muskoka, designated as part one on plan 35R-27382, Obalon Corporation, roll number 4-22-53-01, be declared as surplus land. And that the clerk is hereby instructed to dispose of the said property pursuant to sections 8, 9, and 11 of the Municipal Act 2001. And that bylaw 2024 042 to stop up, close, and convey that portion of the original road allowance lying in concession E, lots 30 and 31, in the former township of Medora, now in the township of Muskoka Lakes, in the district municipality of Muskoka, designated as part one on plan 35R-27382, Obalon Corporation, roll number 4-22-53-01, 
be given three readings and passed. Any discussion? All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Okay. Now we're back on the Auerbach file. Um, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor McIntyre. Be it resolved that bylaw 2024-044 to designate site plan control, Auerbach part lot 27, part of lot 27, concession five, parts two, five, six, eight, and 12, plan 35R-23401, watt, roll number 2-9-087, be ready first, second, and third time, and finally passed. Any questions? All in favor? And that carries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have one resolution to move us into closed. It's long. Take a breath. Moved by Councillor Zavitt, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved that Council convene in closed session at 3.47 p.m. For a number of, for A, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, section 239 sub 2 sub C of the Municipal Act 2001, and that pertains to confidential report CCS-2024-06, B, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, section 239 sub 2 sub C, and advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, section 239 sub 2 sub F, both of the Municipal Act 2001, and that pertains to confidential report CCS-2024-07. C, -C the security of the property the security of the property of the municipality or local board, section 239 sub 2 sub A of the Municipal Act 2001, and that pertains to confidential report CCS 2024-09. Next is litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals, section 239 sub 2 sub E of the Municipal Act 2001, and that re re, uh, relates to confidential verbal report from the Director of Development Services and Environmental Sustainability. And before we do anything with that, is there one more coming out of is the uh, one on? Oh, that's the one. Okay, that's all of it. Um, all in favor? So we move into closed. We will take a break and start unless there's an urgency to is somebody waiting on a lawyer or anything. So we can take a break till four o'clock and configure for closed session. Thank you.